gonna shove, shove it. it. Yeah! He's gonna, gonna shove it. it. Shove it! Right, welcome back to the Smack It Show. Now, everyone's been saying that I've been wasting time watching Dynamite and I should be watching Collision. Their words, not mine. So, I have to give it a try, don't I? Plus, I've been heavily invested in the Adam Cole MJF storyline and I've got to see if they win the tag belts because that's on this show. I'm also making this series because it's time to see who's going to win the tickets to AEW London because I'm giving tickets away. If you want to enter that competition, all you've got to do is email shoveitsquad at gmail.com with a Hogan impression. And I ain't talking Horace. Now, the Hawk has never actually watched Collision before, so now it's time. But despite switching to a brand new show, the very first person we see is Darby Allen. So it feels like dynamite again. This show is coming at you from Hartford, Connecticut, and straight away, it feels like there's more energy in the building, which is great. And we open the show with a ladder match between Andrade and Buddy Matthews. No titles on the line here, but there is a mask hanging from above. There's plenty of big moves in this match, as you would expect. Andrade does a moonsault off the ladder, and the Hawk noticed that the AEW timekeeper is a hottie. Buddy Matthews connects with a massive DDT on the ladder, and also there's a huge flip power bomb on top of another ladder, which is pretty crazy. Andrade ends up getting handcuffed to the ropes by this blonde chick. That's kinky. But it's pointless, because he just frees himself seconds later. Then they do the classic old spot where the handcuffs are switched, and the other guy gets locked to the ropes. But again, pointless, because somehow they have wire cutters. How do they have wire cutters? Who knows? Who cares? All three people end up fighting on top of the ladder, and the Hawk is feeling like he's a big fan of this chick already. She ends up being launched off the ladder, into Matthews, into a table, and Andrade wins the ladder match. Can't complain about that opener. Great moves, great action, and a hottie to boot. No complaints, great start to the show. In the back, a man called Myro is saying something before he's jumped by a jobber, but the jobber isn't good enough, and Myro keeps screaming out Shivani. I have no idea why, maybe he's not a fan of his commentary. Darby Allen has an open challenge which is answered by Minoru Suzuki. This guy badly needs to find a new barber. I'm sorry mate, it's not working for the hall. Darby Allen sits him in a chair and then dropkick smashes him away. The crowds sound a bit dead for this one, it's not a bad match, but they just don't really seem that into it. Darby Allen eventually wins the match just about. I'm told here the storyline is that Darby Allen is just about scraping through his matches, so that's what's going on here if you are wondering. Christian Cage threatens him after the match because they're going to be having a little match for the TNT title. Christian Cage says he's going to send Darby Allen back to Hot Topic. So this blonde lady right here turns out to be the AEW Women's Champion. And the Hawk was wondering because I haven't seen hide nor hair of her since starting this series. But there's no time for that, nobody cares, because here's Samoan Joe, the RRH Champion. He faces the man called Gravity, who's a luchador slash beekeeper. Samoan Joe does his nope move and pretends that there's no gravity. It's pretty funny. Within a minute, Samoan Joe hits the muscle buster for the free. Pretty good to see Joe being booked so strongly. No complaints. Nigel McGuinness on commentary says that Samoan Joe is the man that Gravity never forgot. Guess because he's fat. CM Punk is the next man out. He's incredibly popular with this audience. He gets on the mic, he's not having a match, and he tells the crowd that he'll never let them down and he'll always show up for AEW. CM Punk confirms that he's going to be coming to the England show, which is great news, and he has this little bag with him. Out the bag, he pulls a title, and he says that he's the real world champion in AEW because he was never beaten for it before he took his break from the company. He sprays the title with an X, which seems to get some booze from the crowd for some reason, I'm not sure what that's about. He's interrupted by a man called Ricky Starks. The camera lighting is so funny here. They're desperately trying to find some muscles. Like, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? This guy seems like a complete goofball. I just can't buy this guy having a chance at beating CM Punk. But then he changes the Hawks' mind and cuts a really good promo. He makes claims that he should be the world champion because he beat Punk recently via cheating. Punk agrees to a match with Ricky Starks on the next collision but under the stipulation that there'll be a special guest referee. They're running down who it could potentially be, and Julio De Niro, holy crap, he gets a shout-out, remember that guy? But it's not going to be him, because apparently this man is unbiased who they're having. It's Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Now this is complete rubbish, because I've watched TNA, and he is a biased Dragon Steamboat. He screwed people in that company, and I never understood why. It's a trios match now, it's Juice Robinson and the Sons of Billy Gum. 
Seeing these guys for the first time properly did get the hawk thinking. It's not a criticism, but why aren't they tall like Billy Gunn? Billy Gunn is massive, shouldn't these guys be 6 foot 6 or something? Why haven't they inherited that tall gene? It's just a bit strange. They take on Darius Martin, Action Man, and holy crap, it's Vikingo. Love Vikingo. Anyone who's watched this channel for a while will know that I enjoy this guy's work. I know he's small, but I think his moves just have that extra oomph that other guys don't have. And I think he has a marketable look. And push right, this guy could be massive for a company. Vikingo does start out winning, but then they take advantage of him and they slide him out the ring like a seal. It's pretty funny on his little belly. The heels are being goofy and they're posing with a cut out picture of Jay White on the outside. They're just not taking this match seriously at all. There's also a really weird spot in this match where Vikingo does a double foot stomp, but the gun son kind of no-sells it because it looks so bad, I guess. Vikingo does land a crazy dive to the outside, but ultimately the heels win when the gun boys do some cool finisher to win the match. Vikingo slightly disappointed the Hawk here. I was looking forward to seeing him, but he didn't do too much. The gun son with the man bun impressed me the most. He stood out a lot. I think this guy has a lot of star potential. Wow, Kira Hogan still exists. Remember when Impact, when it was like Battle of the Booties and everyone had a pick ass? Well, she certainly does. She faces Mercedes Martinez. This doesn't really feel like a match I was expecting to see in AEW, so it's got the Hawks' attention. It seems to be a pretty back and forth match. There's lots of big moves in this match. It's certainly better than the last AEW women's match I sat through. Kira Hogan hits Mercedes Martinez in the face with her ass, which got a laugh out of the hawk. Mercedes Martinez beats her with a vicious submission move. Two feathers up from this hawk. Great, but I can't help but feel that Kira Hogan could be a star for a company if you treat her right. I don't know, let me know in the comments down below. Is this woman got anything? Now that woman from earlier is back. It turns out her name is Dasha. Not sure what she's running from. It's just the tag title match left now, the main event, the whole match that this series has been building up to for the idiot so far. I'm looking forward to watching it. I want to know which way this one goes. Adam Cole and MJF will challenge for the tag belts, which belong to FTR. There isn't much crowd noise for FTR. That was a bit disappointing. The Comage team actually acknowledged the lack of crowd reaction here as well, which surprised me. But I have to say, I love how the double clothesline has become like a really feared move in AEW when it's something so simple. It shows what great wrestlers these two are to be able to get something so simple over. MJF is doing lots of cheating to the fans' amusement. But soon the fun and games come to an end, and MJF is the one to get isolated, just like all the matches I've seen so far in actuality. He eventually hits the double DDT. I noticed that sign in the crowd, I think someone's been watching Wrestling With Regret recently, saying I eat corn the long way. There's some pretty funny signs on this show actually. Adam Cole is a hawk on fire. He's kicking everyone. Yosemite Sam manages to slow him down with a crossbody. But then it happens again and MGF counters with a kick. I like that counter, that was good. They keep reversing tombstone pile drivers, which was a nice spot as well. And then MGF actually does a tombstone pile driver, but it doesn't end the match. How times have changed. Cole somehow kicks out of a superplex straight into a frog splash. The crowd love this match and they want them to fight forever. The big story here is that MJF saves Adam Cole from a move, so he is actually being a good guy. But then MJF is beaten and the match is over. Wasn't expecting it to end that way. So MJF is definitely a good guy and they all shake hands and grab asses. MJF is having a mental breakdown in the ring and you're not sure what's going to happen. But then we get the biggest crowd pop of the night when Adam Cole and MJF embrace and nothing happens. No one turns on anyone. So nobody turns on anyone but it's a feel-good ending to the show, I guess. So that's Collision. All done. A very enjoyable watch. Definitely better than the last couple of episodes of Dynamite that the Hawks been watching. I enjoyed this a lot. The only thing on the show that I didn't really feel was great was the Darby Allen match. The crowd were dead for it, and I didn't really know why it was happening or what the point was. But it wasn't a bad match. I just wasn't into it. But this was basically the best TV episode of AEW I've watched since doing the Idiot series. It had a good mix of action, comedy, hot women, and good matches. No complaints, I can't find much to nitpick here. Now, as a comparison, as an extra additional punch to the gut, the Hawk thought it would be cool to also watch Dynamite and do a little comparison, just to see if Collision really is that much better than Dynamite. Watch them back to back and see who gets the smack. I feel like I'm starting to understand who a lot of the people are on the show, and it's making it easier for me to watch. Plus, this is their 200th episode. That has gone quick. Time sure flies like the hawk. 
But just like the last episode, the show starts out with Crisp Jericho, who's going to be teaming up with Taker Shitter to face his former son, Sammy Guevara, and that other guy, Daniel Garcia, sorry. It's not a bad match, but once again, the crowd are noticeably quiet for it. Who are we meant to be cheering for here? Aren't they all heels? Why is Taker Shitter in the match? What's his role in this? I know he's part of Don Callis' little five-skin team, but is it necessary to have him in there? Wouldn't it be better to just have Jericho take on his two former sons in a handicap match? That way everyone involved has some sort of interest in the match. Ultimately, the human five-skin gets involved in the match. He cheats. Chris Jericho hesitates but does eventually take the pinfall victory. Not a bad match, just not as good as the collision opener with that ladder match. And it's going to be hard to top that. Tony Khan appears and he cuts a promo like he's got a stick wedge firmly up his ass. But it's actually quite a nice little video package he's doing here. He's basically thanking everyone who's made Dynamite what it is for 200 episodes. No complaints. Randy the Ram and Jack Perry are still feuding, but Jerry Lynn reveals that he can't get cleared to wrestle anymore. But he does have an ECW wrestler who can take his place on the show. And just like that, no job Rob. RVD is in AEW. Didn't see that one coming. He has horrible generic rock music. They really need to work on the music on this AEW show. He looks scruffy. He looks old. Jack Perry runs away. They don't have a match, but they are going to somewhere down the line. And that's fine. I'm not really sure what No Job Rob can even bring to AEW. He hasn't had a good match in a decade, so don't be expecting too much, but maybe it'll be his big final match. Who knows? Another match is a hardcore match with Trent Beretta, Pentagon, and John Moxley. You know it's going to be alright because Moxley is good with the hardcore gimmick. Pentagon hits a destroyer through the table. Moxley hits a pile driver into the thumbtacks. But the Hawk has one question. This is great match action, but why is John Moxley here? I thought he was a main eventer. Why is he struggling so much to beat these guys? It shouldn't take a main eventer 20 minutes to beat these two guys, especially considering this is John Moxley's sort of match. He should be dominating, right? It doesn't make John Moxley look good. It drags him down to their level. On Collision, we had that squash match with Samoan and Joe, and it made sense and it got to the point quicker. This was not a bad match, but guess what? Moxley doesn't even win this match, so are they doing a losing streak gimmick with him or something? Why is he losing to two mid-carders in his style of match? It doesn't make sense to the Hawk. For some reason, the Blackpool dogfighting crew still exists. Why? Get these guys off my screen now. I've been watching for like three weeks and I still don't understand the point in these guys. We get continuation of the storyline with MJF. He cuts a very long promo where he tells the crowd that he has ADD which gets an ADD chant from the crowd. I have never heard that before in wrestling. Maxwell gets less cooler by the second as he talks to the crowd for ages about how he was bullied and how he's still haunted by the bullying. And all of this is used for an explanation as to why MJF has been such a dick since the start of AEW. He's not a bad guy, he's just got demons. This is honestly a really weird but good promo. Adam Cole arrives and tells MJF that he's very proud of the man that he's become today. It's like a father-son thing. It's starting to make MJF lamer by the second. Then they agree to have a match for the title at AEW All-In at Wembley. So the Hawks All-In, because I'm glad I've been watching AEW now because I'm going to understand the main event. This is why I did this series. That's going to give me so much more match enjoyment. And I'm happy for these two guys to fight. It should be good. But the Hawk does have one question, because after the promo, Adam Cole's little friend is seen having a mental breakdown and kicking off. And it's honestly hilarious seeing this guy flip out. But... Why is he so mad? Shouldn't he be happy that his little friend is getting a world title shot at the biggest show for AEW's history? It doesn't make sense to the Hawk. The Elite will be having a triple threat match, and I wasn't really feeling that interested until... A wild slap nuts appear. Come on, Jay. Jeff Jarrett. God. Everywhere the Hawk goes in 2023 even, I am haunted by this man. He teams with Jay Lethal and the Giant Silver. Will I ever escape Slapnuts? He hasn't missed a step though, and he's still highly entertaining in the ring. But the Hawk has to question why does he have to bring his bitch wife Karen to AEW? No one wants to see her. I never thought that I'd be watching a Jeff Jarrett match and actually hoping that he'd win. Jay Lethal now resembles a brick. The Jarrett crew keep interfering on the outside, which causes the Hardy Boys to come and help out. That was random. Jeff Jarrett is unable to break his guitar and draw any dimes, and Kenny Omega wins the match against Jay Lethal. Really entertaining, enjoyed every second and a lot of nostalgia in there for me. 
The Elite cut a promo after the match, revealing that they've re-signed with AEW to the surprise of nobody. Strickland and AR Fox beat up Nick Wayne in his own garage. It resembles a snuff film. Very interesting though, great stuff. Vikingo and Commander challenge for the tag titles which belong to ROH, the Aussie Open team. And it's a really great match. It's probably my match of the night between the two shows. I love this match. It was David and Goliath the whole way. Both teams have some really unique and crazy offense. I love this match. Go watch this one. This is the Hawks recommendation. It's a shame that Vikingo can't get the win, but it definitely helped build his star here and it made both teams look credible. They should be on the main show more and not shoved on RH. Great, brilliant match, loved it. This is what the Hawk has been asking for on this series. Give me match variety, not three matches in a row. Every match on this show of Dynamite has been completely different. And there's even a women's title match to end the show on. Neither of them are hot, but you can't always get everything you want in life. Actually, the Hawk thinks Tony Storm might be all right. You have to feel that this is AEW trying to put out some fires from that terrible women's match on Dynamite. And they do that. They have a great compelling match with the two and Sheena is eventually crowned the new AEW Women's Champion. They needed to get the belt off Tony Storm and give someone else a chance. But then she can't do everything. AEW has to book this division better. She can have great matches, but if she's not on the show, she's not going to do any better than Tony Storm did with that belt. But we'll see where this one goes. So really, the only downside to this entire show was the Blackpool dogfighting crew. Get them off my screen. I have no idea why they still exist. It's pointless. But I'm nitpicking, it's not a massive deal, they didn't have much time on telly. This is honestly the best episode of Dynamite I actually enjoyed watching, I didn't have to force myself through it. Now this is where the Hawk has to make an admission. I was hoping I was going to compare Collision and Dynamite and I was going to do this speech at the end where I was going to say, Dynamite is rubbish, Collision is so much better. But I can't, because I genuinely enjoyed both shows. AEW is on a roll. Even if it's got some interest for me, that must mean something. I'm an idiot and I don't like anything modern. I asked for match variety and they gave it to us and this helped me concentrate so much better. They need to get around to booking more matches for the Wembley show. We only really have one confirmed as far as I know. So they need to build up for that because we're only three weeks away. And that'll be my little reminder. Don't forget to email shoveitsquad at gmail.com if you want to enter to win ticket to All In at London. But yeah, as far as the Hawk knows, there's only one match actually confirmed from that AEW show in London. And that isn't enough. And if you don't agree with that, tough.